We'll sing a song together. It's called Old Church Choir. Um, first, a very, very quick announcement. Whether you're here, whether you're home, we want you to know that we are opening our children's church, Elevate, back up next week. We're going to be opening that back up. One crucial reminder for that is we would normally bring our children here first and then we will walk out to Children's Church to help social distance and make sure we're being safe in every way we can. We are actually going to, you, you will actually drop your child off at the youth building, which is right through the underhang right here. So it's that separate building that's attached to the church right here. If you will drop your child off before the service. And um, we're just very excited about that. That's gonna be a lot of fun. And um, invite your friends and family to that as well. So, Old Church Choir. Mm -hmm. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. And here's just a couple events to put on your calendars. Good morning, and welcome to Troy First Baptist Church. Here are a few announcements to add to your calendar. Calling all singers, you are invited to join us for a special one-time all-volunteer choir to join the praise team next week, October 11th. We'll be practicing on Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Make sure to go to our homepage on our website to find the song you'll be singing. All youth, put down on your calendars that we will be traveling to the Whitewater Center on October 17th. There are limited spots for this trip, so make sure to secure your spot with a $25 deposit. We will leave Saturday the 17th at 9 a.m. The church will cover lunch and dinner that day. 
church members. You are invited to help out with Trunk or Tree on October 31st from 2 to 4 p.m. We need families to sign up to decorate trunks, help with the picture booth, and we need all the candy we can get. Contact Pastor Cameron if you would like to sign up to help with this special day. We are excited to announce that we are opening up Sunday School next week, October 11th. If your Sunday School class would like to start meeting next week, it is required that you contact Pastor Jeff and register your class and find an appropriate location to meet. All parents and children, Elevate is starting back up next week, October 11th. Make sure to check out our children's page on our website to be up to date on our guidelines for our in-person children's service. At Troy First Baptist, we take a country every week and pray for it. Today, we ask that you take a moment and pray for the people of Gibraltar. Gibraltar is well placed for outreach. There are many tourists, especially Spaniards, coming for duty free goods, several thousand Moroccan guest workers, as well as Jewish and a Hindu community. The lack of churches for both southern Spain and North Africa makes Gibraltar a key position for regional outreach. Pray that local congregations will gain a passion for outreach. Pray for the nation of Gibraltar. Lord, we thank you for the gospel that saves anyone, anywhere. But Lord, help us to be faithful to take the gospel everywhere. We pray for the little nation of Gibraltar. And we ask that you would strengthen those Christians who are there to spread the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would uh, do a work in the hearts of those people. Lord, do a work in the hearts of our country as well. Lord, I pray you'll do a work in our hearts this morning as we gather in your name, as we celebrate the Lord's table and open your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Special service this morning, we are going to ask all of our deacons to come forward with Mass. Everyone but the pastor who's misplaced his. So we need all the deacons, ordained deacons, past and present to come forward. And our new deacon, Scotty Reynolds, if you would step to the front. The chairman of the board, Benny Hampton, and I will lay hands on him and pray for him. And then we will allow during the next song all of the other deacons to come up and have a word with him, socially distanced with masks. But if deacons, if you could come spread out somewhere, and Benny, you take one shoulder, I'll take another. I see my daughter's mask. I'll put on a Cinderella mask. How's that? <laughs> After I pray. So deacons, as we sing the next song, each one of you will have an opportunity to come up and share a word with Scotty. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for calling our brother Scott Reynolds to the ministry of deacon at Troy First Baptist Church. We now set him apart and we ordain him to this ministry in your body, Troy First Baptist Church. May he exalt you, O Lord, in the midst of your people. May he offer spiritual sacrifices to you and boldly proclaim the gospel of salvation. We ask your help for him as he serves as a leader and leads as a servant. Lord, may he faithfully administer the ordinance of the New Testament church. Make him a faithful caregiver, a patient teacher, and a wise counselor. And Lord, grant that in all things he may serve without reproach, so that your people may be strengthened and your name be glorified in all the world. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. While you're seated, let's sing together Amazing Grace. That amazing grace.
before you. God, we thank you for the ordination of Scotty. God, we pray that you would be with him. God, as he bears new burdens, as he takes on new responsibilities for the sake of the church, God, we understand that that is the sake of your gospel, of your very name. And what that resembles is, is 
beautiful sacrifice and selflessness. And I thank you for that visual this morning. God, we pray right now that you would give us ears to hear. God, give us hearts to listen and and hands and feet to act and obey. We love you and praise you and worship you for you are the highest thing above everything in in this world. In your name we pray. Everybody said. Somebody say something. We've all been in that awkward, silent moment when no one can think of anything to say, but it's even worse when something is terribly wrong and we know what needs to be said, but no one will say anything. When no one will tell the emperor he has no clothes, When no Telemachus will stand up at the Roman Colosseum and say, in the name of Christ, this must stop. When no Paul Revere will sound the alarm that the enemy is coming. When no one will speak up for the innocent and protest against slavery, against the Holocaust, against racism, or against crime. You ever heard one of those low talkers had to say, please speak up. I can't hear you. Do you think sometimes God wants to shake us and say, please, somebody needs to speak up, say something? Now, of course, some of us are cowardly and silent, and others of us never stop talking about things we know little about. But somewhere in the middle is where we need to be. Not saying so much that no one wants to hear us, not talking about things we know nothing about, Especially saying nothing when something needs to be said. The wise man says in Proverbs, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold with silver lining. There's nothing like saying what needs to be said. There is an explosive power in speaking out. Knowing what needs to be said and then actually knowing when and how to say it. Today, in the explosive chapter 5 of Daniel, the story of the original handwriting on the wall, we will learn the explosive power of standing out. Join me in Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords. There is no transition here. Nebuchadnezzar has been king for many years. He's been king for the whole book of Daniel. But all of a sudden, with no transition, Daniel 5 says, Belshazzar the king. Who's he? Well, actually, he is the grandson-in-law of Nebuchadnezzar. He prepared a feast for a thousand of his lords. I'll say, that's a thousand. have you ever had ten people for dinner? That's pretty overwhelming. How about having a thousand? Archaeologists have actually uncovered this very room where this feast would have taken place. And it is 56 feet by 173 feet. Imagine this building twice. And so they're all meeting, and it's only 1,000. Sometimes they would have up to 70,000 at once in a great feast. I guess that would be outdoors. Where are they? They are in the capital city of impenetrable Babylon. He drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father, technically his grandfather-in-law, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem. Here's a nod to the old king who we didn't even mention his passing. Now, they're in Babylon, and you should know that this is the most impenetrable city that ever existed in human history. It was surrounded by 60 miles of double walls with a moat in between the walls. These walls were 335 feet high, 85 feet wide. And inside, they were prepared to be encircled. They had 20 years of food stored up and an unlimited water supply with an underground river flowing right through the middle of the city. So he's a little bit overconfident, thinking no one will ever overtake this city, which Daniel had predicted some 70 years earlier, would be overthrown. Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom will not last. There will be another one to follow you. So now... It is October 13th, 539 B.C. Belshazzar is 37, and Daniel is 84. 
But most importantly, the city of Babylon is surrounded by the armies of Persia, the very kingdom that Daniel had predicted 70 years earlier would conquer them. He made a great feast, and he's doing that in spite of the threat outside. The wine makes him feel good, but of course it never changes the circumstances, and it does make him do something stupid. While he tasted the wine, verse 2, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Now it was common for these polytheists, believers in many gods, to be multicultural and respect other gods. But he chose to deliberately sacrilege this god and show contempt for the God who predicted the downfall of the Babylonian Empire. It's almost as if he's shaking his fist at God and saying, Come on, conquer Babylon, I dare you. Now Nebuchadnezzar had taken the stuff from the temple because God had ordained it in punishing Judah for her sins. But God had not ordained for Belshazzar to desecrate them. They brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them, these holy vessels. They drank wine and praised the gods, not the God of heaven. They praised the gods, plural, of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. It's not like there was a shortage of clean glasses. This was a theological dare for him. They praised the other gods to the exclusion of the God of the Bible, the God of Daniel. Remember the image of Daniel chapter 2? The image had gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Oh, do you think that's just a coincidence? No, this is an act of defiance, rebellion, and arrogance. This is a situation that demands speaking out. We all come across them. Many times in our lives, there are certain explosive situations that are just over-the-top evil, where you shouldn't, where you just can't stay silent. And so we come to the question this morning, the all-important question is, when should we speak out? When do we hold our tongue, and when do we speak out? Maybe your friend has crossed the line and cheated on their spouse. Do you tell them? Your boss, your company has started not only cutting corners, but breaking the law. A bully is beating up a weakling. Your church has stopped preaching Jesus and Him crucified and started preaching politics or prosperity. Oh, there are many occasions that demand speaking out, and we basically know. When Nikita Khrushchev was premier of the late Soviet Union, he was making a speech one time before the Supreme Soviet, and he was on a roll critiquing his predecessor, Premier Stalin, who killed tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And then someone in the Supreme Soviet sent up an unsigned note. He opened it up, glanced at it, and without telling anyone what it said, he said, who sent up this note? People started looking around at each other. His face turned red. This was the guy who once took his shoe and beat it on the pulpit. He was so angry. When no one stirred, he said, I will give that man one minute to stand up. Seconds ticked off and no one moved. He finally read out the contents of the note. He said, someone writes, what were you doing when Stalin committed all those atrocities? Good question, isn't it? And then he shook the note at the people and said, I'll tell you where I was. I'm the, I was in the same place where the coward who sent this note up, I was doing and saying nothing. Pretty graphic example. In Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, Jeremiah said, I said to myself, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. He was biting his tongue, literally. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Sometimes we say, no, 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 I'm not going to talk. I can't, I can't be the one to say something. 
Something needs to be said. But I'm afraid that if I say something, I'll just make matters worse. Sometimes something needs to be said. And sometimes silence is not golden. Sometimes silence is yellow or cowardly. Sometimes we need to speak out. In verse 5, God speaks out. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and rode opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king, everyone started turning, and he noticed, he looked, and he saw the hand, and he saw it writing. He saw the part of the hand that wrote. God speaks out. You know, the walls couldn't keep God out. The moat couldn't keep God out. The gates and the guards couldn't keep God out. Notice in the first phrase, it was the very same hour they brought those vessels from God's temple that God showed up. No coincidence. He had justified God. Notice God comes in just a hand. This time it's not the mighty wind. It's not a loud earthquake. It's not a bright fire. It's not even a still small voice. It's a silent hand. It writes on the plaster of the wall. I told you they found this room in digging up ancient Babylon. And the walls are covered in plaster. Notice the hand wrote. A voice speaks and the sound is gone. A hand writes and it's there. There's a written record, a permanent record. But if it's only a hand, that's pretty spooky, don't you think? So verse 6, the king's countenance changed. You bet it did. He was defying God and all happy, and all of a sudden he wasn't happy anymore. His thoughts troubled him. Yeah, I'll bet. So that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked. That's where this phrase comes from. Someone's knees knocking comes from Daniel chapter 5, from this king to rise. His knees knocked against each other. Yes, the color drained from his face. And he was afraid that that hand was going to come and get him. You know what it was that was really troubling the king? It was a guilty conscience. This disembodied hand would be scary anyway, but more so to a guilty man who justified God. It's like a letter from the IRS. We'd all be troubled if we got one, but especially if we hadn't been paying our taxes. So here comes the hand. And here we go again, verse 7. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. They keep trotting in and out. We saw it in Daniel chapter 2. We saw it in Daniel chapter 5. Bring them all in. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, everyone except for Daniel, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Why can't he read it? Is God's handwriting messy? Sometimes my secretary has to ask me, what does this say, Pastor? My handwriting's pretty messy. And I say, I, frankly, I don't know. Ever get a doctor's prescription? You wonder how the pharmacist can, you wonder if you're going to get the right pills. Is this messy writing? So all the king's men came in verse 8, but they could not read the writing. Maybe they didn't understand the language. Or make known to the king its interpretation. The king Belshazzar was greatly troubled, his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. You see, here's the problem with false religion. Ancient idols or modern prosperity gospel, they're fine most of the time when everything's going along wonderfully. But when troubles hit, then when the crisis strikes, they have no answers. But God has the answer, and He's already written it in a language they can't understand. What we need to see is that God has already spoken out. We already have His Word. And just like the hand that came and wrote something to Belshazzar, we see in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God, the very first word of the book of Hebrews, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, this is by far the weirdest one, right? The handwriting on the wall has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. The main part of the sentence, the main phrase is, God the subject has, verse 2, spoken. In my Bible I have them circled. God has spoken. Into the silence of our lonely universe. Are we the only ones? No, we're not. 
And it's not E.T. out there, it's God out there. God has spoken. If it wasn't for God speaking, we could not know. We would know that there is a God because of the vastness and the power of the universe and the order of the universe. But we could not know that God is love. But God has spoken. And in His Word, He tells us all of our most important questions. Where we come from, why we are like we are, and where we're going. So God has given us His Word, and it's powerful. But sometimes we just don't pick it up and read it. I remember when I was in junior high school, our youth group went to this youth rally. And the youth evangelist preached, and he seemed like he was preaching right at me, and he was talking about speaking out and being a coward. And he challenged us. There was several hundred there from several different youth groups. He said, what I want you to do is tomorrow when you go back to school, even if it's a public school, I want you to take your Bible and put it on the top of your stack of books and carry it around from class to class. And let that be a silent. If you don't have the courage to speak up for Jesus, carry your Bible. How many of you will do that? I raised my hand. And because I raised my hand, I knew I had to do it. So the next day I took my Bible and I put it on the top of my stack of books in the first class and no one said anything. And I said, whew, that was a close one. And in my second class, it was on the top of my stack of books when this young lady sitting behind me, it wasn't even a bully boy, it was a girl behind me said, holy Bible, what are you, a holy roller? So I know you're expecting me to say, I turned around and I shared Jesus with her and we had a moment of prayer and she accepted Jesus. But I didn't. I just blushed. Maybe you're thinking after that class, I went to my locker and put the Bible away for the rest of the day. No, I did not. But I put it at the bottom of the stack of my books. I was keeping the letter of the law. I had the Bible on my desk, each one of my classes the rest of the day, but hidden where no one could see them. You know what I had there? I had the Word of God with all the answers. I didn't need to be ashamed of it. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. But like a coward, I put it underneath the stack of other books. I didn't take it any other days that year, I'm ashamed to say. But God did it work in my heart and made me into a preacher. And now I carry that book around and it's the only book in the stack. Verse 10, they can't get any answers out of all the false religions. So the queen, this is not his wife, but his grandmother-in-law. She remembers Daniel. Because of the words of the king and his lords came to the banquet hall. What's your problem? The queen spoke saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. Okay, stop those knees from knocking. She says, you don't need to sweat it. I know, verse 11, there is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. You don't even know him. Shame on him. Maybe she's a believer. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God, the one you justified. And the days of your father, remember him, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, technically his grandfather, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Ironically, he follows the very God you justified. Somehow, Daniel's got lost in the shuffle. Oh, how quickly we forget. You didn't even invite him. But he's the problem solver, verse 12, inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king tried to name Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and not he might, he will give the interpretation. Isn't that our job? People don't know what the Bible means or says. We're supposed to tell them. We're supposed to be Daniels. Verse 13, Daniel was brought in before the king. King spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel? He's never even met this guy. He should have been his chief of staff. He used to be Nebuchadnezzar's chief of staff. He used to be number two in the kingdom. But he says he's never even met him. And notice what he does. Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Grandmother... Nebuchadnezzar's wife, introduces him as a wise man who knows all the answers. He tries to put Daniel down. You're that slave. You're that prisoner of war. Try to put him in his place. Maybe he had heard of him. She hadn't even mentioned that he was a Jew. 
Oh, I haven't met you, but verse 14, I have heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Oh, now that he wants something, now he you know, pays homage. You come highly recommended. They say you can answer this. Verse 15, now the wise men astrologers have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not give the interpretation of the thing. You think Daniel's having deja vu after all these years? He's already done this at least twice. Again, the uselessness of empty religion, positive thinking, mysticism, no answers. So verse 16 I've heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Well, I got an enigma for you. If you can read that writing over there on the wall and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be, I already made the deal with all these guys, you shall be clothed with purple. Maybe I've got an East Carolina signed jersey for you. A chain of gold, a Mr. T starter kit around your neck, and you shall be third ruler in your kingdom. Third? Is Bell only second? Is that all he has to offer? Daniel might think, wait a minute. I used to be second in the kingdom. You're going to give me third place? Verse 17, this is classic. Here is Daniel's answer. He answered and said before the king, oh, something needs to be said, right? Keep your gifts. Let your gifts be for yourself. That's all you got? Hey, look, I used to be second. Keep your stuff. I don't need that stupid jersey. I don't need that stupid gold. I'll tell you what you want to know for absolutely nothing. I will read the writing to the king. Not only that, I will make known to him the interpretation. Isn't that our job? God has already spoken, so we're to speak out and tell people what he said and what it means. That's my job on Sunday morning, not to tell you what I think, but to tell you what God said and what it means to us. And that's your job when you leave this place. Not what your pastor says, but what God says and what it means. So here he goes, verse 18, O king, he doesn't say, O king, live forever, because he knows he's not going to even live till the next day. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a much better man than you, a kingdom and majesty and glory forever. So he really gets in, and I told you so, kind of like God rules and kings drool. But here is the big lesson. My God gave your grandfather a great kingdom. And by extension, God gave you this kingdom as well. In verse 19, because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Because he trembled and feared before God after he learned his lesson. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. Whoever he wished, he put down. Sound familiar? King Darius, you have the same power. Guess where you got it. It's the theme of the book. God rules, not you. Verse 20, when his heart was lifted up, this is where we left off last week in chapter 4. When his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Have you heard that story? If not, go back and read Daniel chapter 4. Then he was driven, verse 21, from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. Given him a lesson in humility. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the mountain dew of heaven. Till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men. Here's the theme of the book. The Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints over it whomever he chooses. Oh, you would be lucky to get what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. You got the background. You want to know what the handwriting on the wall? Oh yeah, that's right. You want to know the handwriting on the wall, not the history lesson. Okay. Verse 22, wait a minute. Let's talk about you next. But you, his son, Belshazzar, I've talked about Nebuchadnezzar, you, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. I know what you know. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. Somebody's got to say something. And since you've given me the floor... Don't plead ignorance. The reason that hand appeared is because you defied the Lord of heaven. They've brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And when exactly did that hand appear? Coincidentally? Yeah, you practically dared God 
to show up. You have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, blind gods, deaf gods, dumb gods, dead gods. But like Nebuchadnezzar, they are gods created in your image. If we are created in God's image, and we are, that not only limits us, that exalts us. We are unlike the angels or the animals created in God's image. But when we create so-called gods in our image, that degrades us. These gods, which do not see or hear or know, the God who holds your breath in His hand, the real God, the only God who holds your breath in His hand. There's a picture of God's control over every one of us. He owns all your ways. The one who keeps your heart pumping. You've not glorified. No, as a matter of fact, you've defied Him. Then, right then, the fingers of the hand were sent from Him. No coincidence. And this writing was written, finally you've waited long enough. When you disrespected the God who holds your breath and owns your way, that hand showed up and wrote, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Uparsin. Here's what it says for the very first time. We haven't even been told what it said. Let me tell you what it means, verse 26. This is the interpretation of each word. Again, this is the definition of preaching, taking God's timeless word and applying it to our particular time and situation. So the first word is mene, and it's there twice. The word mene means numbered, and he says it twice. So God has numbered your kingdom, he says. He says it twice because it's doubly sure. Today we would say your number is up. Then it's tekel. Tekel means weighed. And that means you have been weighed in the balances and found a few bricks short of a load. A scale is an objective standard. If we had no objective standard, how big is it? Oh, about this big? I'm trying to explain that over the phone or in an email. Okay, well, you hold out your hands. But, and a standard is a foot. And if your foot is different than my foot, then we better have a standard ruler. And a pound better be a pound the same as you sell as when you buy. How do we ever agree on the standard for good and evil? There has to be an absolute standard. According to humanism, there can be none. But God is the standard, and Belshazzar is found wanting. And the final word, uh, peres. Your kingdom has been divided. Peres, ufarsin, means divided. And here, there is a pun because Peres sounds like Persians, that army that's surrounding the city right now. Your kingdom is divided, he says, and given to the Medes and the Persians, the very kingdom that I predicted, that God predicted 70 years ago, would defeat you. You want to know what it is? You're doomed. Your number's up. You've been found short, and the kingdom is divided and given to the Persians. You asked for it, you got it. So how do you defend the Bible? I would suggest to you we defend the Bible the same way you would defend a lion. You got a lion in a cage and someone is attacking it. Kids are poking at it, throwing stuff at it. You know how you defend a lion? Pretty easy. You just let it out of its cage. How do you defend the Bible? You don't need to defend your Bible. People have been foolishly, uselessly attacking the Bible for thousands of years. But all you have to do, you don't have to defend it. All you have to do is just preach it. God has already spoken. Finally, He has spoken to us in His Son. So here He gave the interpretation, verse 29. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with the purple and put a chain of gold around his neck. He may not have liked it, what was said, but he was impressed, and he kept his end of the bargain. So he gave him his autographed East Carolina jersey and his Mr. T. Scarter kit. And he made him the third ruler in the kingdom, the title of which Daniel had no interest in. What is Belshazzar doing here? Is he saving face in front of a thousand of his best friends? Or is he trying to buy off the man of God? You can tell that Daniel doesn't get excited at this point. He knows the Persians are at the gates. He knows what's going to happen next. They're surrounding the city. And God has declared that they would win the battle and that Babylon would fall. 
So great, you're going to make me captain of a sinking ship? Oh great, I'm the owner of a bankrupt, obsolete company? Oh great, I'm Lord of the Flies? Thank you very much. You can keep your junk. I want you to see here, third, that God challenges us to speak out. Daniel took the opportunity to speak out when God gave him the chance. And God challenges us to speak out in explosive situations too. We simply can't make excuses and say, well, God has already spoken out. They got the Bible. Why would they listen to me? Why can't they wait for someone else to say something? There's a great verse in the book of Esther. Esther is the queen of a kingdom called Persia, ironically. The next kingdom that also falls. But Queen Esther has married into the throne room. And her uncle Mordecai challenges his niece Esther, queen of Persia, to speak out. He says, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. God will send someone else. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament, certainly my favorite in the book of Esther. If you remain completely silent at this time, God will send someone else. There's plenty of people that God can use. You will miss out. Sometimes silence isn't golden. Sometimes it's cowardly. But who knows if God put you in this place. God put Queen Esther there for that moment. God put Daniel there for that moment. God put me here this morning for this moment. I know that. And God has a moment for you this week. Somewhere in your life this week. Something will need to be said. God has already spoken. But the world is waiting for someone, maybe you, to give them the application. Maybe God this morning is challenging you to be the one. Here's the end of the story, verse 30. That very night, the very night he shook his fist at God and said, I'll show you, my kingdom will never fall. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. O oh, king, live forever? No, Daniel didn't waste that breath. Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Look at the difference. Nebuchadnezzar got a whole year to repent before judgment fell. Belshazzar got one night. History tells us how the Persians conquered mighty, impenetrable Babylon. Oh yeah, it's like the sink, the... the unsinkable Titanic that even God couldn't sink? Guess what? Babylon fell in one night. While the king was partying recklessly, smugly, overconfidently, the Persians were outside digging. They were digging a trench for the river that flowed under the moat on one side, and they dug it around to the other side, and they diverted the river. And that night they finished the trench, and they walk right in on dry ground. A very clever military strategy. And perfect timing. You see, as Daniel said in chapter 2, the mighty head of gold, Babylon, fell and was succeeded by Persia. And the very night was October 3rd, 539 B.C. Daniel was where God had him to deliver a word to Belshazzar and to us. He spoke up and he gave him a chance to repent, and of course he didn't. But the warning becomes a warning and a lesson to us all. Certain situations demand speaking out. Yes, God has already spoken out. Did Daniel recognize God's handwriting? Think about it. God wrote on that wall. The very hand that wrote the Ten Commandments and gave them to Moses... And he broke them. Wouldn't you love to see God's handwriting? The same hand that knelt in the sand and wrote in John chapter 8, when they were accusing that woman caught in adultery, we don't know what Jesus wrote, but it's the only words that are recorded that he ever wrote. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote about him. Jesus never wrote a word that exists to this day, but we have 27 books in the New Testament that tell us all about Jesus. Those same hands wrote on a wall in Babylon. And that hand that wrote the Ten Commandments, that wrote in the city of Babylon, and that wrote in the sand, were nailed to a cross. But we haven't stopped writing about him since. 
And people have been speaking out about him since. Will you speak out to a world that needs to hear what God has written? Peter Cartwright is probably not a name or a face that you recognize. He was a circuit riding preacher in the early 1800s. And he went about preaching revival. He personally baptized 12,000 converts. Everywhere he went, he spoke courageously about Jesus. One Sunday morning, when he was about ready to preach, he was told that there would be a guest in church that morning. And a note was passed to him that President Andrew Jackson was in the congregation. Maybe you recognize this face from a $20 bill. Don't get used to it. It won't be on the $20 bill much longer. He's going to be replaced with Harriet Tubman. He was told not only that Andrew Jackson would be in the audience, he was told to be guarded in his remarks. And so Reverend Cartwright got up in the pulpit and he said, I am advised that President Jackson is in attendance this morning. And so I am advised to be guarded in my words. I will be. And so I tell you, President Jackson, if you do not repent, you will go to hell. Boy, there was a quiet moment in the congregation that morning. I guess there were a few gasps. You could hear a pin drop, but nobody dared drop a pin. And after a while, Peter Cartwright continued his message. Yes, the congregation was shocked. They wondered how the president would respond after the service. The president made a beeline for the front. People wondered if there would be blows. But President Jackson shook hands with Peter Cartwright and said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could whip the world. He admired him for his courage. I wish he would have repented. But he admired the man's courage. What about you? If not somebody say something, it needs to be said. We need to stop saying somebody needs to say something and start saying, I need to say something. If not me, then who? Say that with me. If not me, who? How about the next one? If not now, when? If not now, when? Those words haunt me. God has put me in positions all my life. Sometimes I have cowardly bit my tongue and said nothing to my eternal regret. But for the rest of my life, I want this to be my byword. I would rather make the mistake of saying too much than to say too little and to say nothing. And that someone enter a Christless eternity when I had the opportunity to share Jesus with them. God is challenging each one of us today to be a Peter Cartwright, to be a Telemachus, to speak up and to say something. And if not me, who? If not now, when? Let's pray. God, thank you for the challenge from Daniel. We thank you for his faithfulness over the many years. And even when he was forgotten, he stayed faithful to you. And when he was finally given an opportunity to speak up, and maybe his vocal cords were rusty, we're thankful that he spoke up. And although his audience, the king, did not repent, did not listen, we're thankful that we have his example. Help us as your children to speak up and share your word. You've already spoken. Help us to share your word with a world that needs it so badly. Lord, if there's one here or listening online who does not know you as Savior, I pray that today, like Andrew Jackson, we challenge them to repent, to believe the gospel that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and to accept him as personal Lord and Savior by your grace through their faith. Lord, for those of us who are your children, give us courage. And Lord, as we share together in the Lord's table today, may, be, may we be reminded of the penalty that you paid, the price you paid for us, and may we be emboldened to not be ashamed of the gospel nor of our Savior. For in Christ's name we pray, amen. We're going to be sharing the Lord's table this morning. If you do not have the elements passed to you earlier in the service or as you came in, you just raise your hand and we'll have one of our ushers.